Today, I feel that we need to get into a closer connection with the Holy Spirit. We need to be in a place where our unity with Christ, as Paul talks in his letters to the Ephesians, should be so strong that it transcends every layers of human conditions that we are going through at this moment. And for that very reason, I would like to welcome you to enjoy the anointing of the secret place. The anointing of the secret place. My dear brothers and sisters, I want to confirm to you and affirm to you that there is a special place in the presence of the Lord that releases his anointing so radically that it transforms those who receive it almost instantly. Although it may not be secluded or isolated, this place, however, is a sanctified one. It is a sacred place where you connect with God in deep waves of intimacy as the Holy Spirit fills you with himself to empower and to equip you for greater things in the kingdom. One of God's chosen who enjoyed such privilege, who loves to receive this anointing in the secret place, was David. But being anointed in such a place does not mean that life is going to be problem-free. In fact, they often become more intense and demonic. And we saw this very clearly in the life of David. Every time that David received an affirmation of God's calling over his life, through the pouring of the anointing oil over his head, it seemed every demonic force that worked in the lives of his enemies would rouse up and try to harm or thwart him from God's plan. Somehow the enemy finds ways and means to discourage to make lives difficult for people who struggle. But when you receive the anointing of the Lord, it kind of becomes even more intense. It kind of becomes even more difficult. Now, when he was anointed the first time at his father's house, if we study the Bible, we would see there that he soon had to face Goliath, a giant who was challenging all of Israel's warrior. This is recorded in 1 Samuel chapter 16 and also in chapter 17. You can study more about this later. And the Bible tells us that David won that fight. But in the process, he incurred the wrath of King Saul who sought to kill him, and the vengeful spirit of the Philistines. They've lost their champion, and they're not going to forget about it. So now David had a huge target painted across his back. After he was anointed to become king, crazy things start happening in his life. And to quickly fast forward, make a long story very short. After Saul's death, David was an anointed king by the leaders of his tribesmen, the people of Judah at Hebron. You'll find this in 2 Samuel chapter 2, verse 4. And I learned from my devotional this morning that it was at Hebron that David received not just the second anointing, but also the third anointing. And this is one of the most ancient city in Israel, Hebron. So old that it was older than the city of Zoan in Egypt. So you can understand now. If you consider the Egyptian to have quite an old history, an ancient history, there are cities in Israel that have their own 
um, history, which can even be longer. So, the second anointing, the second time that David was anointed as king for Judah at Hebron, what happened? Ishbosheth, one of Saul's sons, was crowned king over Israel. And there was war between the house of Saul and David for a long time. We find this in 2 Samuel chapter 3, verse 1. After his rivals were removed, however, David was eventually anointed king for the third time at Hebron again by now all of Israel, all of the 12 tribes of Israel. As he was consolidating his position in Jerusalem, 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 17 records, and I want to read this for you. When the Philistines heard that David had been anointed king over Israel, they went up in full force to search for him. Let's leave it there for now. Now, these were David's long-standing enemies, I told you earlier. They were against him even ever since he killed Goliath, their champion. They would not forget that shameful defeat. And they somehow want to restore back their lost pride and their lost glory. Like David, any time we are anointed, our enemies too will multiply and become brutal against us. Now that may discourage some of you who will not want to have anything to do with the anointing if your problems are going to get worse. You will be contented to live the average life of mediocrity with no aim and no ambition. But if you begin to hear that divine calling in your life and you start to stir up that gift inside of you, the Holy Spirit will overwhelm you with supernatural empowerment so you become a demon slayer. Amen. Isaiah chapter 59 verse 19 promised, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will raise up or will lift up a banner against him. That standard will be the fiery you that the devil will have to run away, that the devil will have to flee. I see it that way when I look at this verse. The minute that you're anointed, you become God's standard. You become God's representative. You become a, a child of the Father with a destiny of his kingdom. You become an enforcer of the kingdom of God. Now, many have mistakenly believed that the anointing is docile or dormant, and it is just meant to produce a few goosebumps and a little harmless hype during revival services. On the contrary, I believe any time the anointing shows up, there will be mighty movements and manifestations that far surpass mere emotionalism. In fact, the anointing of the Holy Spirit has the power to unlock the bondage of the devil from each of us. How do I know this? Isaiah chapter 10 verse 27 says, It shall come to pass in that day that his burden will be taken away from you, from your shoulder, and his yoke from your neck, and the yoke will be destroyed because of the anointing oil. This is from the New King James Version. Anything or anyone that the enemy may use to enslave or oppress you will be broken. So you are free and you are made whole to become God's instrument of triumph. Can I have an amen? We should be confident and expect that every time we gather together, yokes will be broken and destroyed. Bondages will be cast off. Bodies will be healed. Deliverance will be radical and provisions and favors will be abundant. That is exactly how things should happen if the Holy Spirit has its way with us. Now it is really sad to see 
that the level of expectation for the supernatural miracle working power of God is far too low and even non-existent in many Christians and churches these days. Even if there aren't any sick that need to be healed among us, at the very least, we should experience the fire of God's presence that elevates us to new levels of His glory and strength every time we meet. We need to be in a place where God has control over us, that He takes direction of whatever we think, say, or do. I want to be a person who is always moved by God at all times, whether it's a movement that reflects uh, anger or it's an action that reflects some solemnity, whatever it is, I don't want me to be politically correct or socially acceptable. I want me to be divinely correct and heavenly acceptable at all times. Because if I'm not that, I have no right to be standing here and ministering to you. Because I have nothing of my own. Like the early church, we should be experiencing a fresh experiencing fresh baptisms of the Holy Ghost and fiery anointing any time we worship, whether it's here in this building or elsewhere. But when we come together as fellow believers, we need to be in a place where the fresh fire of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is real. It saturates us. It takes control of us. We need to be distinctive in front of heaven. Because that's the only way where you are being led by God. Not by anything else, not by any hidden agenda, not by any particular denomination, not by any particular institution or organization. You are led by God. Can I have an amen? And so for that very reason, for that very purpose, there should be such hunger and deep craving for the tangible presence of God's glory. That we will not be satisfied with anything less. We are ruined for anything. Only for the anointing, for the Holy Spirit, for God himself in our midst. Nothing else will do. We cannot settle for anything less. Remember, you will get only what you are willing to reach for. So if you can live without the anointing, you will not bother with it. How do I know this? I've seen. In the life of those who have been um, in this ministry, they've been anointed, they felt good, they had a few goosebumps, they were able to speak in tongues. But eventually when it didn't serve their convenience or their purpose, they would leave. And then the anointing would have no place in their life anymore. I've noticed that in my own life as well. When I was very religious, I would come to church out of obligation. It wasn't because I want to. It was simply because I had to. We have these two words in the Kasi language, which when translated, it means I cannot help it. So if you are going to come and meet with the Lord because you have no other options and you had to, might as well not. Because God doesn't want to have, he doesn't want to have an obligatory time with you. He wants to have a real intimate time between father, son, or father and daughter. It cannot be any other way. Sadly, the majority of Christians are living as people who don't care about the anointing. And that in itself is an oxymoron. What am I saying? Listen. The word Christian actually means one who has been anointed. You see, because the word Christians come from the word somebody who is in Christ. The word Christian basically means that, in Christ. So if you are in Christ, who is this Christ? The word Christ itself 
comes from the Greek word Christos, which is a derivative translation of the word Mashiach in Hebrew. And the word Mashiach or Messiah means one who has been smeared with the anointing. The word anointing or Mashiach actually means one who has been smeared, one who has been anointed. Smeared or anointed. Please understand this. So therefore, if you are a Christian, you must be anointed. If you want to become a Christian, you have to be anointed. You have to be in a place where God and you are intimate. Otherwise, it's just a two-hour affair every Sunday. After the service is over and done, God is not done with you. When the pastor releases you from here and says, the grace of the Lord Jesus, the love of the Father, and the anointing of the Holy Spirit, amen, and you leave from here, God is not done with you. Just because we said amen, it doesn't mean that our relationship has to end with God. You're taking him with you to your home to your family, to your relatives. You're taking him with you tomorrow to your place of work or to your place of study. You're taking him to your relationship, whether it is discreet or not. You're taking him to your pleasures, to your choices, and into your decisions. Why? Because you're a Christian. Why? Because you've been anointed. Why? Because that is who you are, Christian. But if you're not like that, then you're not a Christian. Let us be clear that our hunger for the living God will draw us closer and into deeper intimacy with him. How much we hunger for God will determine our spiritual temperature. Jesus himself said in Matthew chapter 5 verse 6, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. You will be filled in the exact proportion to the intensity of your hunger. And so we need to ask God to increase our hunger and our desire for him. If you're not hungry, you will not eat. People who are not hungry either have eaten, they're still full, or it's because they've lost their appetite because of a sickness, because of a weakness, because of some issue in their health. So also it is true in the spiritual aspect of our lives. If we are full of the Holy Spirit, and if we are full of that anointing, then it works out that we will not need more of it. But actually, that is also not true. Because the anointing will create more hunger for the much more. And so therefore, for you to hunger for righteousness means that you already have been given so much righteousness that you cannot live without it. You've become addicted to it. Now, when David received his third level anointing, in Hebron, by all of the leaders of Israel, let me tell you, the first thing that happened to him was that he showed up immediately on the devil's radar uh, screen as a potential danger. Please keep in mind that until you are anointed, you are actually no threat to, to the enemy, to hell. And the devil is pretty amused with your petty, powerless religiosity. He looks at you and your life is pretty predictable when it comes to your religion, when it comes to your worship, and when it comes to your prayer life. Most of you, you don't even have a prayer life. I've seen some people, even in my own family members, whose prayer life are just words. And when you're in a hurry in the morning, your prayer life is just routine. Be careful. 
But if you're real and you have a true connection with the Lord and you receive that anointing, something will happen to you. The very second that you enter into the secret place of receiving God's mighty anointing, you are noticed by every demonic spirit, by every demonic entity who will try to assault you with every form of evil, with every kind of attack and assault. So if your anointing is from the Lord, you can be assured that you are in for great victories ahead. Don't worry about that. Even if the enemy notice, even if the devil is trying to come against you, he's not coming against a weakling. He's not coming against somebody who is an orphan. He's not coming against somebody who is defeated. No, you're not a loser. You are on the winning side. Remember that. You're already a winner. Why? Because you associate yourself with a winner. The Bible tells us that everything Jesus did, every miracle, every healing, every deliverance was by the anointing of the Holy Spirit. In fact, go to the book of Acts in chapter 10, verse 38, and you have these lines. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. As such, every born-again, blood-washed, spirit-filled child of God should be actively seeking and passionately pursuing a new level of anointing because we are at war on a totally new level. When you first entered the sanctuary, I don't know when was the last time, perhaps last Sunday or maybe a few months back, the very first time that you entered into this place and you get into connection with these words from the Lord, with these anointing, with the anointing from the Holy Spirit, you've been elevated to a totally new level of warfare, to a totally different kind of fighting. Please believe this truth that we are fiercely fighting devils and demons of higher rank and abilities in the kingdom of darkness today than we did in the past. We have never seen such a season as this where all kinds of diseases, all kinds of demons, deficiencies, disasters, derelictions and destructions, wow, so many deeds, are so rampant and, inten and intense worldwide. And so a nonchalant, haphazard, half-hearted and lukewarm relationship with God is not going to cut it anymore. And so if you are not committed to living in the secret place where God's manifest presence releases his anointing, we will surely fall under the assault of hell. You see, the devil, Satan himself, and all of the cohorts of hell, they're not fooling around when they come to attack you. They don't just come to you and tempt you. And if you're not tempted, they're like, oh, okay, lost cause, let's go home. No. If they can't tempt you like that, they'll tempt you the other way. Look at Jesus. He was tempted thrice. Satan doesn't come to Jesus, tempt him the first time. And when Jesus refused and quoted the word of God, the devil would say, oh, okay, that's it. I've lost. No. He thought three times was a charm and he would get Jesus finally. And even after the temptation in the wilderness was done and it was over, look at what the word of God says. He left Jesus, but he was waiting for another opportune moment. When was that? At Golgotha, at the cross. He used every religious force available in Israel at that point of time just to get at Jesus. Have you ever thought it like that? You look at the cross and you look at the crucifixion of Jesus and some of you are trying to name names and you're trying to accuse a few people. Well, the fact is, the fact is Judas Iscariot uh, betrayed him and all of the disciples left him stranded all by himself and Pilate was responsible for bringing out the execution order and stuff like that. 
These are all facts. We cannot deny them. It's written in the word of God. True. But you see, the source of all of that aggression, of all of that antagonism, goes further than Jerusalem. It comes from the source of all demonic darkness, from hell, from the heart of the enemy. And this enemy is still active today. Just because we don't see demons face to face, it doesn't mean that they don't exist. It just means that they know how to do their stuff in more modern warfare. COD. What am I talking about? PS4 or PS5. You see, they know now how to attack you. So you need to be careful. And the only way that you can develop spiritual muscles is for you to be anointed in the secret place. In the place where you and the Lord and the Lord are you have proximity, have relevance, have radical reality with each other. Because by yourself, Jesus himself said in John chapter 15, apart from me, you can do nothing. Without me, you can do nothing. I want you to go to that, that most wonderful psalm that talks about the anointing in very powerful ways. Psalm 91. Now Psalm 91 speaks of a covenant of blessings and promises that is only between God and those who will respond to his calling and be ready and willing to be fully anointed. My dear friends, you cannot claim the blessings of Psalm 91 unless you are living in the address mentioned in Psalm 91, which is the secret place of the Most High under the shadow of the Almighty. Can I have an amen? It is here that we learn how to defeat and annihilate the enemy, the secret place, the shelter of the Most High, under the shadow of the wings of our Father. Some of you may be wondering, how come there are many in the world who have never been anointed and they're doing fine? Why do you have to preach so much about this anointing? Well, if they have not been anointed by God, I've got news for you. It means they are enjoying a counterfeit anointing of the enemy as mentioned in 1 John chapter 2, verse 27. They enjoy pleasure, power, prosperity, and all kinds of benefits coming from the enemy. Because you see, the enemy knows how to tweak and twiddle you with incentives. He has a program. He has hidden agenda. But he will not make you to read between the lines. He will be very permissive with whatever you want and whatever you need. And you feel that, yes, there's a relationship that I'm having with the enemy is something which is so very useful. It's beneficial for me. He doesn't nag me when it comes to my pleasure, to my wantonness, to my desires, to my cravings. And somehow things work out right. I just have to do a little wrong once in a while. I just have to sin, that's all. And so therefore, you are being empowered to enjoy many things. But what you don't realize is that you've sold your soul to the devil. And of course, when it comes time to payment, then you begin to realize that things are not what they seem. Things are getting crazy. Now this type of demonic force is rampant among rebellious and unteachable Christians besides Satanists, occultists, witches, perverts, addicts, and those who indulge in the dark arts and in alternative lifestyles. I have a concern for them. That's why I'm preaching this portion of the sermon. And so you, if you've been influenced those of you who are exposed yourself to social media, you will find that all of the influences that are there have hidden motives. Their influences of your life is to get at your soul. The choices you make is not just for you, it's not just for them to profit from your buying and your shopping and your inclinations. They want to get at your soul. 
You see, when Satan came to tempt Jesus in the wilderness about turning stones into bread, it wasn't because he was concerned of the hunger and the, um, and the health of Jesus Christ. No. He was just concerned to get at the soul, at the heart of our Savior. If he can, then plan, then the salvation plan is broken. It is destroyed. So when the enemy come against you, he's got agendas. He's got motives. And you need to be careful. And the best thing is to stay away from him. The best thing is to walk away from him. Have nothing to do with him. Even though he look fashionable, attractive, so cute, be careful. And you see, the enemy doesn't come with horns and a red suit. It's usually in a nice three-piece suit and um, very attractive and very, very convincing. Look at what you listened from the world of the internet. It convinced you. Sometimes you feel convicted. But if you read between the lines, you'll begin to realize that that's a counterfeit anointing. That's a dangerous lifestyle. That the choices you might make are not only choices that will damage your future here on earth, it will destroy and damage your destiny and your commitment with the Lord. My dear precious friend, the anointing is not wishful fantasy, but a cutting edge operating system meant to weaponize and arm the child of God in daily warfare. The anointing is for casting out devils, healing the sick, delivering the bound and the oppressed, setting captives free and releasing incredible breakthroughs. When you operate under the anointing, everything you do become part of your warfare against hell. This includes you, your attending services, like this morning, tithing and giving, your singing, your clapping your hands, and even your personal time of prayer and devotions. Under the anointing, you will be able to minister the grace of the Lord even through non-conventional ways like preparing food, caring for the sick and the needy, or even playing a musical instrument. For instance, when David played his harp, evil spirits that were tormenting Saul left and he was relieved. The secret place where your anointing flows is not a mere hideout where you cower in to escape your enemy. No. Of course it is a place of safety, where we are cherished and celebrated as the Father indulges us in His love and compassion and His holy embrace. He is Dad, after all. He will always try to make you better. And so therefore, when He takes you into a secret place of embrace and of anointing, there is so much of care and safety and protection and love and peace, you feel protected, you feel secure. But let me tell you, the place, the secret place of the anointing, it is more of a place where we mature and are empowered for warfare and mighty exploits. Let me say that you were created and you were born with warfare in mind. And the enemy knows this. And he knows that the only way to counter you is to engage with you subtly with his schematics, with his lies, his deception. He will try to intrude into your connection with God because he knows once the connection is in, you become a warrior. And not just any ordinary warrior, you become a victorious warrior. Amen. Now, if you study Psalm 91 carefully, you will notice that it talks about all the safety and protection for those who dwell in this very secret place. Okay? Look at Psalm 91. From verse 1 onward till verse 12, it talks about protection, security, 
peace of mind, joy, healing, health, deliverance, all of that. But verse 13 shifts from safety and protection to authority and aggression against the enemy. I can even say that it started to mention antagonism against the devil right there. This is an anointing not only for defense, but for demolishing the works of the devil. Let's read it together. Psalm 91 verse 13. You will find this. Come on, read this with me. You will trample upon lions and cobras. You will crush fears and serpents under your feet. This is a promise. This is written with the perspective of and with the vision of victory. Trampling lions and serpents is not an easy task. But if you have been anointed in the secret place, it is not you who crushes the enemy. Why? Because Paul declares it in Romans chapter 16. He said, the God of peace shall soon crush Satan underneath your feet. Amen. Now that sounds a lot like Luke chapter 10 verse 19. Read this again with me. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. Nothing will harm you. Without the anointing of the Holy Spirit, you will be defeated by the enemy who will attack and harm you in every area of your life. That is why he will do his best to thwart you from being anointed and from staying in the secret place of your anointing. You see, Satan is not dumb. Satan knows. He knows the source of your empowerment. He knows the place where you experience new skill sets of warfare. And so he will try his best to keep you away from that place. Further, the anointing of the Holy Spirit is the key to the abundant life promised by Jesus. David wrote in Psalm 23 verse 5, You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. As God's children, we are never meant to live the less than life, either here or in the hereafter. To prove this, let me draw your attention to something very powerful. What did David do when he received his third level anointing and he heard that his long-standing enemies, the Philistines, they were coming out against him? What did he do? Now, let me complete the reading of 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 17. Can you put it on the screen? Yes. Which we left halfway earlier on. I read this verse, but I didn't complete it totally. So let's do that. Let's complete the whole verse. When the Philistines heard that David had been anointed king over Israel, we stopped here early on. Look now. They went up in full force to search for him. Oh, we stopped there. Search for him. And what's the reaction from David? What did David do? But David heard about it and went down to the stronghold. He went down, in the King James Version, they used the old English word, and he went down into the hold, into a kind of a basement, or into a trench sort of a place used by the army. A quiet place, a secluded place, a protected place, a place where he can have some privacy. What was David going to do here? He was going to connect with the source of his anointing. E. He is going to be with the anointer in his life. Who is that? David's creator. David, master. The real king in Israel. Who is that? Yahweh. The Lord God Almighty. The Most High. The Ancient of Days. We have so many names. I simply call him Dad. Then verse 19 says, So David inquired of the Lord, look at that, 
Shall I go and attack the Philistines? Will you deliver them into my hands? The Lord answered him, Go, for I will surely deliver the Philistines into your hands. Look at this. God didn't say, Go, and I will, do, I will rout out the Philistines with my hands. No. God's going to co-labor with David. God's going to fight with David against the enemy. And David have always learned this. When he went and approached the giant, he didn't think that he was to defeat Goliath by himself. He had a slink, he had his stones, but he knew that he didn't need extra armor. He didn't need all of those um, uh, the breastplate and the helmet and the swords and the spears and the shield. He was too young. It wouldn't fit him. He wasn't trained for all of that battle gears. And so he just took his slink. But he has had history with God. You see? What do you mean history? That was the first time he was anointed, right? Yes. But you see, he was a shepherd who had had past victories with lions and bears. Huh? Yes. Not with giants, but now with different kind of predators, lions and bears. And he was a shepherd boy. They didn't say he was a mature shepherd, a professional shepherd with 60 years of experience. No. He was a shepherd boy on the hills of Bethlehem. But something was happening. You see, David drew courage from the fact that whenever he go to fight the enemy, whether it was a predator or it was a giant, listen to this, God was never far behind. In fact, God was already ahead of him. God was behind him, to his right, his left, above and below him. God was reigning in the inside of little David. Oh boy, can you see this now? And so therefore, this very David, who has now been anointed thrice to be king, now all over Israel, he still depend on his history. With what? With God. So he goes into the hold. He goes into the stronghold. And there, got down on his knees. I love to get this, that I got this picture. I was so grateful. Got down on his knees. That's not what a warrior is, should be doing. But that's the best thing a warrior should be doing when he faces impossible odds. But if he have a God of all impossibilities... Amen. You're saying it wrong. It should be a God of all possibilities. No, a God who transcends all impossibilities in your life. Amen. Now listen to this. He connected with this God and he started doing what? As you guys would be doing in the office tomorrow, he'd be downloading solutions. In how many MB per second? You don't know, but it's really fast. He talked to God. God answered him. And God says, with your hands, I'll deliver the Philistines into your hands. I'm going to use your two hands. I'll be there with you, but I'm going to use your hands. And I'm going to deliver the Philistines into your hands. So we'll need your hands, okay? So I'm going to strengthen those arms. I'm going to put extra power into those muscles. We're going to go against the Philistines. And my dear son, you're going to win. You're going to win. The stronghold that David ran into was the secret place of the Most High, the secret place of the Lord God, where he was energized and revitalized and where he received instructions and directions. David knew his success was not just in being king, in being anointed as king over Israel, but in having a deeper intimacy and communion with the Lord himself. He knew he was chosen and anointed by God, but he also knew, look at that, he must stay connected with God if he wants to rule Israel with God's authority. Amen. How do you think Solomon learned to ask for God's anointing and help when he became king? He must have seen his, his father, 
King David, who ruled by talking to God every time, communing with God. Even when he was sinning, he would talk with God. Even when he failed God, he would go back to God. Do you understand that? And so when Solomon looked at David, he says, hmm, so this is how you do monarchy in Israel. And so that's how it is required of us to be with him so that we can be the kings of the king of kings and lords with the Lord of lords. Can I have an amen? Hallelujah. There are some who boast about being anointed, however, once. Some who would boast that they're being anointed once and how they now speak in tongues and they can hear from God. But they are so busy with many important things and they ignore the need to come to church, Bible study or prayer meetings on a regular basis. They assume that God will somehow understand because they would if they could. But they can't, so they won't. Sadly, they are in a very dangerous spiritual condition if they will not bother about their intimacy with the Lord. They're not only in danger of backsliding, they are actually backsliding. What is really scary is that we are living in the darkest, most treacherous, and most evil times of our entire lives, and multitudes of Christian folk act like nothing is serious, and they carry on with their business as usual. David knew he could not depend on past anointings for new challenges and expect new victories. He knew he needed the fresh fire of God blazing in his life. Dear friends, I'm telling you, we all need to get down into that stronghold today like David did and get a hold of God until God gets a hold of us. We need to cry out to God for a fresh baptism of Holy Ghost fire, not just in times of trouble, but every single second, every waking hour of every single day of our lives. You know why? Because you are the anointed ones. Christians, the anointed ones. And if that name is real and you live by the authority of that name, then you cannot live without what, without the heavenly substance that that name refers to, the anointing. My dear brothers and sisters, before the service get over, lean unto God until you receive your anointing in this secret place so that when you leave from here, you're not leaving alone, you're leaving a winning champion. When David came out of that stronghold, you know what he had? He had divine presence, divine instructions, and divine power. He had vision, he had revelation that were real, radical, and relevant for him to win. And the Bible says in 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 20, So David went to Bial Pirazim, and there he defeated them. He defeated the Philistines. And he said, as waters break out, the Lord has broken out against my enemies before me. That's the purpose of the anointing, my dear friends, to smite the enemy and to undo the works of darkness. 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, but the Son of God came to destroy the works of the devil. I'm with Jesus in this. I'm here to destroy the work of the enemy. If he's been lying to me, I will run to the truth. If he's been giving me ill health, I'll be running to my healer. If he's been binding and oppressing me, I'm looking for my deliverer. I'm not going to do it by myself. I'm going to find victory in the one who is my champion. Amen. The Son of God came to destroy the works of the devil. And that means that you need to be in connection with the ones who can destroy every works of the enemy in your life. Please understand that it is in the secret place of the anointing that God will use you for incredible unthought of feats. Noah was in such a place with the Lord. And so he could do something he had never done before. 
build a gigantic ark that could accommodate all species of creatures on earth before the flood. Elijah was in such a place too. And so he could call down fire from God, something he's never done before, to consume a soggy sacrifice on a damn and drenched altar. Paul and Peter were anointed in such a place and then they wrought awesome miracles of healing through Paul's handkerchiefs and Peter's shadow, something they've never done before. So if you want to do something that you've never done before, get into that secret place. It doesn't have to be a particular address with a street sign and everything. It has to do with intimacy between you and your father. Amen. He already knows you by name. All you need to do is just go to him and say, Father, done. The minute he comes, he, knows your, he sees your hunger. He sees your thirst. He sees what you need. And he releases his righteousness. His righteousness will anoint you. God knows what new, unseen, and unheard exploits he would do through any one of us, if only we will spend time in the secret place and receive our anointing. So my dear brothers and sisters, come on, let us get back to the stronghold, not just for refuge, but so we can be refreshed, we can be revived, where we receive fresh fire, and where God downloads orders from heaven. Hallelujah. So we are clothed with the anointing and see the kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. That's your purpose. And that's the reason why you need to be anointed. If you think that coming to church here is just for you to hear a wonderful sermon, sing a little bit of song, do a little clapping, give a little tight, and then leave from here, you're wrong. Many of us have emptiness in our hearts. And that emptiness cannot be filled with money, with uh, education, with relationship, with popularity, or with social media, with information. It needs to be filled with the anointing of the Holy Spirit. That emptiness, that hole in your soul, must be filled with the presence of God himself, with Jesus being the Lord of your, and the Savior of your personal life. I want you to come right now and surrender yourself. Because if you're hungry and thirsty, you shall be filled. The anointing comes because you're hungry. The anointing comes because you are yearning. The anointing comes because you are ruined for anything else. You just want to be where God wants you to be. And that is to receive. So close your eyes. All heads bow down, all eyes closed. I just want you to open your heart now. All heads bowed down. All eyes closed. All hearts open. And start seeking intimacy with God. Ready? Let's pray. I want you to start praying. I want you to start going into deep prayer. And if you you want to pray out loud, you're more than welcome. If you want to break into tongues, go right ahead. If you want to stand up, that's up to you. If you want to lift your hands and stretch your hands towards heaven, you can do that. The Lord is in this place. He's going to use you powerfully. But he will use only those who have been anointed. Only those who have received. Only those who are filled. And the only way that you can be filled is only if you remain hungry and thirsty for the more and the much more. Don't settle for anything less. Don't say yes for anything that is just an alternative. Go for the real deal. Ask from God and receive from Him. And let's go to the Lord in prayer. Come on, start praying. Start praying. Start asking. Father, I ask in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. 
I ask that you will increase hunger in each one of us. I ask, Lord, that you will release such a hunger. Remind us that we are empty. Remind us, Lord Jesus, that without you we can do nothing. And so, show us the emptiness, the hunger, the thirst. Help us, Lord Jesus, to be focused on you, the source of all good and wonderful things. You are our Father. You are the ones who will bless us with the more and the much more. We are receiving from you. We are receiving from you. Come on, stay hungry, people. Come on, stay hungry. Even those who are watching online, Stay hungry, people. Work out that appetite. Know that you can only be filled with only one thing and one thing alone. The righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Come on. Father, we come into the secret place. I'm bringing these hungry and thirsty before you, Father. I'm asking that you would touch them, that you would fill them. These hungry and thirsty ones, fill them, fill them, fill them, fill them, Jesus, fill them, loving Savior. Father, we bless you, Lord. And I thank you, Jesus. And I thank you, Holy Spirit, for your presence today. For releasing such glory and such grace in our midst. For making this a privilege, an honor and an opportunity. That we can have you blessing us and using us for the kingdom like this. Lord, every child that has been touched by you. Fulfill. Increase. Increase that anointing over their lives so that more shall be done in them and through them. And I ask for healing over anybody, even those who are online. Healing I release over you. There is healing and deliverance that I'm speaking right now into your heart, into your body into your soul, your spirit. And I'm declaring that in the name of Jesus, you're totally healed. You're totally delivered. You've been set free. Nothing can come against you. Nothing that the enemy has devised against you can be a permanent thing for you. God will see to it that you receive your healing, your deliverance right now. He's providing for you. There are favors and breakthroughs you've never dreamt. He's going to do it for you today. The Lord's going to use you. 